I appreciate you, brother. I really uh, do. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that prayer. Yeah. Three, two. Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implication for the church today. Uh, today, I'm with Michael, our resident physiologist, and I'm Matt Till, lead pastor of Restoration Church in the Chicagoland suburbs. Uh, and Andrew cannot be with us today, so it's just Michael and I. Michael, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing all right. <laughs> oh man, we we uh, we're missing Andrew. Yes, we are. All right. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, the witty banter might be at a, at a, a little dialed down a little bit today. The the heavier and uh, uh, honest questions may yeah, not the, be uh, the present. The question. Yeah, that's right. But that's okay. We're we're missing Andrew, but we're going to continue on and press on anyway because uh, well, you know, we like each other and we also enjoy uh, making sure that um, just all of our listeners are constantly being fed with more ephesiological ideas and concepts. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, this is fun, Matt, to be able to sit back a little bit and kind of unpack this in a very practical way. I, th- I think we talk so much up here, you know, in the head and in the theory that uh, here today we're going to take an opportunity and look at what this looks like in a practical way. Head, heart, hands, right? Right. Head, heart, hands. Right. And so it's like, how do we put our hand to the plow, right? And as Jesus says, once you put your hand to the plow, there's no turning back. That's right. Amen. Amen. And you're doing some cool things out in uh, Lake Zurich uh, in the Chicago area. And of course, we've been watching what you've been doing and uh, trying to think through together what that looks like as we're learning these different principles of, of physiology and uh, and so we're going to turn the tables a little bit, Matt, and put you in the hot seat and uh, try to learn a bit of, of the practicality of uh, the, some of these ideas that uh, we've been talking about. Well, um, let me first of all say that thank you. And that's awesome. Uh, but let me say this. Uh, I am still a student. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. We are learning as we go. Um, and I would even say that we're probably the success story that everybody would, would hope to hear. Um, but maybe not quite yet, but, uh, it's a constant ex- in process. And so like any other great, uh, laboratory technician, when we make a discovery and we learn something and we learn that we get a new data point, we are eager to share that data point and allow the, the greater theological community to take those theological data points and begin to learn to apply them and to expand upon those. So I just come to you as a, as a, as a practitioner of the faith and just say, Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're seeing, and here's what we're trying. And uh, you know, go forth. Yeah, great. <laughs> we're going keep, to keep going back to the petri dish. Hey, yep. Yeah, I mean, that's what we have to do. And so, our conversation today is not by any means suggesting that here's a this is the model. It's a model that uh, is trying to work out some of these first century New Testament movement ideas. And you've had multiple data points, haven't you, Matt, over the course of really what has become a journey uh, as you and Mary are are seeking the Lord and how to best engage your community with the gospel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it is a journey. There's, there is, uh, this is how we just continue to describe it is that this is nothing but a journey. Um, you know, is, is we, we began to plant a church uh, in a legacy uh, model and approach. Uh, we did that and started it in 2017. We got very active and started meeting in 2018. Uh, it was also the period of time that I think uh, here, at least in the Chicagoland area and the suburbs, uh, just briefly tell you about our context. Uh, we've had some of these conversations a little bit on the podcast before, but just for those who might be listening for the first time, uh, we are in a uh, highly affluent uh, suburban context community. Uh, we are in the shadows of two major area, um, uh, large mega churches, uh, Willow Creek and Harvest Bible Chapel, both in 2017 and 2018 and, and continuing through 2019, we're going through a major scandal and upheaval. Um, uh, these were kind of the gold standards of what we called the evangelical church, uh, whether people, uh, willfully enjoyed that uh, or wanted to go along with that or not, they became, they became incredibly influential and affected the ways in which how we did ministry and how most even smaller or mid-sized churches in our context were doing ministry, replicating a lot of their methodologies. And as those churches were starting to kind of find their, um, going through their seasons of, of scandal and going through their seasons of, 
of, uh, I wouldn't say collapse, but uh, definitely uh, kind of refiguring themselves out. So is Christianity. So is evangelicalism. And uh, we are seeing it, seeing it even on the national scale as well. And so there's a lot happening, a lot of shifting of sands, a lot of things taking place um, that are going on in the world right now. And even with just in general, an evangelical world, and especially here in the Chicagoland area, we're kind of going through a bit of an evangelical apocalypse, if you will. Uh, a lot of people are walking around like zombies. They just don't know where to go. They don't know who to trust. They don't know, um, you know, what, what theologies they need to be believing in. They don't know their proper doctrines as to where, what they've been, what, you know, what doctrines that they're, they're supposed to be holding true to. Um, and uh, in, interestingly enough, I just listened, I just, there, a guy in my church this week was just telling me that he joined up with another group of people who just started, they're were, they were kind of expats from this, one of these churches, and they just started getting together and doing a Bible study together. And he goes, Matt, there, it's exactly what we're doing here on Sunday. Mm. They're doing this on Wednesday night. And it's, it is just this, it's simple. And I, I never realized that this is, this is what church, this is what church is. And so I think there's a lot of um, a lot of healing that needs to be done, but also I think people are starting to have a new vision and a fresh vision for what the church can look like. Well, you've just mentioned so many things there that that would be great fodder for our podcast. Thinking about the the coll- parent collapse of some evangelical churches and mm-hmm. the, the traditions that have grown up around those, but also the idea of a simple church and. Uh, trying to unpack what that looks like, because uh, in many ways, that's what we're trying to get at uh, with the physiology. I mean, the church wasn't complicated in the first century, and we've made it so complex now that um, I wonder sometimes if Paul would have recognized or would recognize uh, what the church has become. He might recognize it as uh, something that uh, he read about in the Old Testament in Torah. He might recognize it from mm-hmm. something that he rec- <laughs> that he would see in the synagogues of his day. But um, I don't know if it was necessarily the churches that he planted. Yeah, yeah, and that's not to say again that there aren't times and places for what how culture will affect a church. You know, I can remember when Willow Creek was starting and. To some, I don't remember anything about Harvest except one interesting experience I had uh, there when I was invited to speak about uh, a uh, topic, but I won't get into that. That would lead us down a trail that we don't want to go. But um, trigger a few people. Yeah, I, I remember when Willow Creek started and uh, and reading the stories uh, about Bill Hybels and and the stories that he would write about that and. Um, I mean, it really ca- captured the attention of a lot of people. And uh, just thinking about the timing of all of that, the, the 80s and going into the 90s, uh, mm-hmm. when when we did, I mean, we literally, we did see some significant growth within evangelicalism. Yeah. And uh, those big churches, Saddleback, uh, Willow Creek, Harvest, and others, uh, to some degree, even... Uh, um, What's the big one in in uh, Houston that Andrew likes to talk about? Lake Lakewood, Lakewood, Lakewood. Yep. yep. And these churches that just grew massively. Uh, Crystal Cathedral uh, back in the day uh, with Robert Schuler. Uh, yeah. Houston, that church now yeah. is a, a Catholic church. Um, so, so one of the analogies that because you you mentioned too, like what does it look like for us to return to a church that, uh, or at least to learn from the Apostle Paul, learn from the first century church, and where have we? gotten our ecclesiology is is off and and re in rediscovering the missiology that is really within all of scripture as part of the story of god's movement and his mission in the world to really be a part of what it means to be following uh, lovers of him and lovers of Mm -hmm. god and those who worship him Uh, and so you know that I think to get to the point is like most most Christians and most most pastors that I meet all believe in those things. They they look at scripture and they see God's mission. They they look at scripture and they see, um, you know, we are called to centric in our in, in our um, our in our theology and how we read scripture and and that we are to be lovers of God and lovers of other people. Nobody would deny these things at all. But to but to see though that the systems and the boxes that we create um, that I think have created a sense of security or false sense of security don't get unless the holes are poked in those then we realize maybe how far we have actually come from center or perhaps what god's true heart is within the scriptures or as you often say we often complicate things uh you you write you say in, in more positive ways like i think it's it's simpler than that it's it's a lot easier than that it's it's more clear than that um in that we, we've created a lot of these other kind of structures around us right. and so and and so I, I think for us is we we had to hit a moment of crisis 
early on in the church plant to make us realize that what we needed to do was to relook and, and return us back to scriptures. And that was kind of talking what, about your church plant. Yes. Yeah. So speaking to me specifically to us is like, we hit this moment of crisis. All of a sudden we realized, Oh, wait a minute. Why, why are we hitting this moment? If God is for his church, if God is, if, if Christ is building his church, if we believe that he's called us to do this, if we believe that he's led us on, on this journey, if we believe that, um, you know, we, we were meant for this, and this is something we're supposed to be doing. And, and if uh, we've been praying about it, he's allowed for these uh, people to come follow us and join us in this mission, then why is it not producing what we expected it to produce, right? Mm. And so is even- that, Is that how you would define your moment of crisis? Yeah, it was all of a sudden. It's like, why are the expectate? Why are the expected results not occurring? Right, and so all of a sudden you start to realize, and you go, well, now we have to do some self evaluation, right? I mean, as a, as any good leader, a leader is going to look at the process in which they are producing, which the process that they're that they've been on on a journey on, and go, why is if A plus B is supposed to equal C, why are we not getting C? There's something mm-hmm. either wrong with me. There's something wrong with the process. There's something wrong with the system, right? Uh, for the longest time, I was I was I would always joke about like why are we? Wait a minute, I'm I'm looking at my looking at our, our paradigms. I'm looking at our models, and I go, wait a minute, why am I why am I planting? Why am I starting a new blockbuster video on the day of Netflix? Yeah, like why, right. like the, the suddenly the model was looking very antiquated to me. Suddenly it was looking very outdated and 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 niche. And all of a sudden I realized I look at we're we're in total market saturation, and Netflix was starting to boom. It's like there's a video rental store on every corner, and Netflix is taking off. Why would I bother starting a new I mean, this, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and the, the desire for video rental is, is plummeting. You know what I mean? And so, you know, we can make the, the analogy to say the same thing about the church where the desire for church attendance and church involvement is plummeting through the roof with the church in every corner. There's no, there's no more market share just on a pure business standpoint. There's no market share more for another church in the community mm-hmm. flat out. There's mm-hmm. just, it can't support it at this point, at least the versions that we have of ourselves. And so that, that kind of crisis began to start and stir up within me. And I realized, you know, you take it on personally. Most pastors are going to go, man, I'm terrible. But being a terrible pastor, um, I, God's not with me. He left me. He's, you know, he's gone. I'm going to, you know, moments of depression. A lot of pastors I talk to go there. Um, I too was starting to wrestle through that. And then I began to look and I go, wait a minute, I'm not the only person. Like, it's not me because I, I look at the other churches around me. They're struggling with attendance. They're struggling with budgets. Um, I look at my other fellow church planters. They're struggling. They're in the same positions as I am. Some who have even started a few years before me and, if, and those who started exactly at the same time as I am, we're all in the same boat. And yeah. so I realized, okay, there's something else here. And so now it's causing me, well, is it possible? Is it possible that the structure, the box, the, the format, the formula that we've been handed is it possible that maybe we've gotten this wrong? Mm. And that's the moment of crisis. Yeah, good, good. I mean, we, um, and it might not even be the, the question of, did I get it wrong? Or, but the better question might be, Matt, as I think about this, is that how do we make adjustments in the midst of what we're seeing as this significant <laughs> shift in culture? <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Yes, 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 yes. How do we make the shifts? Okay, can I tell a story? I want yeah. to tell a story. Yep, tell the story. So I've been using this analogy lately and I love it. It's so great. And I and I so I'm just gonna share it with you because I think it I think it applies here. Um and uh so anyway, in the nineteen nineties, um uh Circuit City, if you can remember who Circuit City was, oh, they yeah. were they sure. were the number one uh, electronic retailer in the United States going into nineteen ninety. Hmm. They were on top of their game. They were the ones who capitalized on consumer electronics market, and they were booming. And now everybody was copying the format and the formula of Circuit City. Well, by 1995, by the mid-90s, Circuit City had realized that they're, although they were number one, they were already seeing and watching their profit margins start to drop. Mm-hmm. There were a number of factors at play in that, but they realized that their profitability was already in decline. And they realized that as more retailers, such as now what we know is known as Best Buy, and of wood, which they had no concept of is one day would be Amazon, right? Yeah. But um, you know, you've got these other retailers, even Target and like Walmart are now getting into consumer electronics, uh, Sam's Clubs, all these other, you know, the, the market was becoming more saturated. Right. And now profits are starting to drop and competition was going up. And Circuit City realized they said, listen, we're going to, there's going to have to be a shift in the consumer electronic market that's going to come. But we can't wait around for that to occur. Instead, they hedged a bet against their own business model Mm -hmm. and they decided to launch what we now know as CarMax. 
Really? What's a consumer electronics business doing in the used cars market, right? Uh-huh. They revolutionized the car, the used car market, put all this pressure on the, on, on the existing, um, on, on, the, on the existing formulas of how we sold cars, right? In the United yeah. States, yeah. including all the dealerships. They launched CarMax and it becomes an overnight success. Wow. CarMax floated Circuit City for the next 10 to 15 years. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Profitability. As yeah. Circuit City was starting to decline in their business and as the consumer electronics business was changing and they couldn't change, Circuit City still had some of these old ways and old styles of how they did business. CarMax was floating them into the next decade. And so um, eventually by the mid 2000s, they split the two companies off. They try to reinvent Circuit City. Circuit City eventually closes down and they, they declare for, you know, foreclosure. But now you've got CarMax that's living uh, and breathing and is a, is a fine, viable organization that lives on today. Wow. Here's the analogy. Wow. Yeah. The trend lines are there. We go back and our listeners go back and listen to the state of the church. We've got a number of podcasts on those that go back uh, back in October. And we, we've talked about this with even Alan Hirsch. And we talked about this with Jeff Christofferson. The trend lines are undeniable. The data points are already there for us all. Uh, even as a church planter, I saw the trend lines. I saw the data, but I was ignorant to it. I didn't want to believe it. Um, and mm. instead... I, instead of hedging a bet against the formula or the format and deciding to say, we need to figure out something else, I went through it. (laughs) And now it's like, wait a minute, it's all right there in front of us. And I love the fact that Circuit City as 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 an organization did something very bold and audacious. They decided to say, let's go do something else. We're still gonna, we're still gonna be a business. We're still going to operate. We're still going to find a way to make a living for our, for our families. We're still going to find a way to make a living for other people and make this world a better place. Um, consumer by the, by the goods in which we, in, in goods and services that we provide. Wow. And, and they decided to go do something else and they hedged a bet against their own organization and their own institution. And I thought, what an audacious and bold plan that they made. What, what risk and courage that it took them to make. And I feel like that we as the church are there. We have to start thinking about what audacious things do we need to start thinking about differently now that would cause us to say the trend lines are undeniable. Let us now start thinking about this differently. That's going to bring about the gospel. We still want the same right. end, but but does it have to fit in the same box? Yeah, good. Okay. And this isn't about um, you know tweaking what we're already doing, but it's about how do we regain market share, so to speak, right? I mean, because we're yeah. losing that. Well, yeah, and 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 how do you regain market share by not using the same old marketing techniques mm. and the same old market? Like, how do you regain? You know, like how do you tell the the, the the traditional churchgoer to say, "Listen, there are no more traditional churchgoers to go around." I mean, they're just they're few and far between now. Mm. And anyone who is a traditional churchgoer are just hopping from one traditional church to the next, and th- that number is declining and, d- and dwindling. So how do we engage people with the, the same idea, the same concepts of the gospel, not being snake oil salesmen, but mm-hmm. rather simply saying, what are the other methodologies here? And you're right, it's not just simple tweaks. And I think that was some of the arrogance that I had going into, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit this, and I have admitted this in another, in other context, but some of my own arrogance uh, going into church planting is that that was my that was the pride behind my church planting. And I think, mm-hmm. I think if every church planter is honest with themselves, they would agree with me on this by saying the reason why I wanted to church plant a church was because I believe in the great commission. I believe the gospel. I believe that Jesus wants to save the world. And I think I can do it better. Mm. And, and, and I just, I, I believed I could do it better. I believed I had, I, I had a, I had a stronger ecclesiology. I believe I had, I had stronger methodologies. I believe I was a better teacher. I believed I, I, believed I was, I was more gifted. And I believe that I had the few tweaks that was required of the model to make it work. Mm-hmm. what happens when all that's taken away from you? Yeah. Right. You're now left with something that says, wait a minute, I was wrong. And actually mm-hmm. not only was I wrong, but also I realized that actually the whole system is actually in, in a bit of a crisis of itself. And now I have to rethink about all those things. And that's huge, isn't it? Coming to the point of, of recognizing that you were wrong. Talk, talk about that. Right. What did that do to you? Oh, it was crushing. Mm. It was absolutely crushing, uh, demoralizing, um, depressing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just, it just has been, it's, it's been unraveling. I didn't realize that my identity was tied up in it. Mm. Um, I didn't realize that, um, that I had put so much weight into this, that this was the vision that God had given me, that this is, this is the vision and the calling that I felt like the Lord had for us. And it's like, here we go. We're going to do this thing. It's going to become a reality. And it's like, whoa, there it goes out the window, gone. And where most people would just be, you know, I think a lot of people just 
in, in, in most other scenarios, just be like, well, oh, well, that was a good chance. Let's go do something else now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm letting go of something that is, that is my soul is intertwined with because it's, it's, uh, it, it involves my God. It involves um, Jesus. It involves the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. It involves my, my, my identity, my being. And I put it into the box rather than into a person. And who mm-hmm. who is contextualized and, tra- and and goes into every culture and in, into every context and makes himself known, and and I and I said, oh, but the way that happens is over here. <laughs> it looks like this, mm-hmm. and when this is gone, <laughs> what am I left with? Um, those two things had to kind of be had to slowly separate themselves and yeah. unravel. And it's, it's been an unraveling process and, and admittedly it's been hard because it's been hard for me. It's been hard for my wife. It's been uh, challenging. It's been a blessing to come out the other side of that as well too, as we're processing through it. And it's been hard on our church because they've, they've gone through the journey with us. They've, mm-hmm. they've been standing right beside us. They've been like, teach us, Matt, learn, let, let, let us learn, let us see how this, this unravels and where this goes. Um, and wow. I give them so much credit because uh, they should have all walked away a long time ago. Um, if they were smart, they would have walked away a long time ago. Uh, but yet they, yet they, they too have believed they too have seen, they too are watching and they too are in, in going through the journey as well with us. And, and so I, I just give them a lot of credit for saying, yeah, I, we're with you on this and we're going to take the time it needs to take. And we're going to look at the scriptures because we believe too, that there's maybe something we've been missing. Yeah, that's neat. I, I mean, I remember the stories that you've shared with me and I, I've been so encouraged with restoration and how they haven't let you. Uh, leave, and uh, they, they've really. Grasped- I tried quitting. <laughs> and they're like, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was great. What a way! And that was such a beautiful expression of the body of Christ. You know, at that moment yeah. when you really, you're, you're, you've let go. You've released it. You're, and you're, you're almost giving up completely. And they're coming around side around you and Mary and saying, you know what? No, we're not going to let you do this. You've mm-hmm. led us here. Now you have a responsibility to keep leading yeah. us. Yeah. And, oh uh, my gosh. What we had for. we had one guy in our we've got one gentleman in our church, and um, he he looked at us and he goes, "Well, you started a family, mm. and we're not just going to let you walk away that easy." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, that is really helpful to hear right now." Mm. And and it was it was so right on so many levels. It wasn't manipulative. It was just true. And it was about, it was a greater picture of, the, of I think, what the church is meant to be. And mm-hmm. it is meant to be this family. It's meant to be these people um, that we get to be a part of and do life together with and relearn how to do that. Apart from all the trappings of consumerism, without all the trappings of programs, without all the trappings of marketing and clever marketing, mm-hmm. without the trappings of trying to figure out how do we artificially grow this organization so that we can continue to support a pastor full time, how we can continue to, how we can work towards a building, how we can have a worship team and a band and slick music and programs and kids mm-hmm. ministries, but rather how do we learn how to be the people of God, the children of God and to live on mission with him in our everyday. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So we're getting a little bit ahead. And in fact, we're not even getting to what I was hoping that we would get to today, but <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Cause this has been great. So Matt, you talked about, you learned that you were wrong. You learned that you were hanging on to this box and, and trying to make that box happen. Yeah. But there came a point when you realized it's not working, it's not going to work. Um, God shaking up everything. What was it then that you latched onto that keeps you in the game, so to speak? So oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I latched onto. Um, there was a number of things. I, I think I, I feel like I really kind of pulled into. Um, I knew that God's uh, mission for the world was that we are to be a part of that. Mm. Acts one eight, I think, is is one of those key passages for me for such a long period of time knowing that uh, when Jesus just before the ascension is telling his disciples and of course is implicate, you know, it, it, it implies for all believers of all time. And he says that you're going to receive power when the Holy spirit comes upon you and you're going to be my witnesses. Um, and you're going to be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth and how the Holy spirit is still at work in, in today today, active today, that that is part of the role of the Holy Spirit is for us is to be the witnesses of Jesus and the witnesses of his his gospel. And so I knew, like, listen, that that promise does not change. That doesn't go anywhere. That hasn't gone anywhere for 2,000 years. It's still today. It's still 
true today as it was 2000 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm holding on to that. Like there's, there's something here to learn from this. Right. And, and that, that doesn't go away. That's, that's still being present. The great commission as well, going disciples of all nations, the great commission doesn't go away. That is still standard. It's a constant, right? So this is what Christ has called us into. This is the life, which he's called us into. And then, um, and then at some point, you know, you get to the, you start reading the, the new Testament letters and then all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at uh, Paul in a new way, you're reading uh, Ephesians, you're reading Galatians in a new way. And then you're starting to kind of see some of these, these pieces that come together. And then I get back and I, I'm back into Acts and I look just at the simplicity of Acts chapter two. I, I just keep going, going to this all the time. Uh, we've, we've said it multiple times on this podcast, but Acts 2.42, and they were devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and the prayers. And it's like, it was like the most simple, organic thing you could ever think of. And you, you just look at it and you go, wait a minute. If this is what they did, this is the, this is the this is the this is the model that they began. This is how the disciples began to gather together. And then you kind of look at this, and it's of the few things that they were devoted to, and you see this play out for the rest of the New Testament. There's some appointments of elders. There's some there's some other kind of organizational things that start to take place. But this is this is it. This is this is it. And so we began to kind of just pull away and strip out all the extra the excess fat. And so for us is that we knew that we needed to be called on mission. But we also needed to know that we needed to get rid of all the other distractions so we could see and hear from the Lord clearly. Mm, that's neat. That's neat. So this is where you are now. This is where we find you. And this is where Restoration Church is. And uh, you guys still, you gather every week. Uh, talk about that a bit. Yeah. What that look like? <clears throat> Yeah. So we're, we're, we gather weekly, you know, we tried a couple of different things early on. Uh, we were, we were renting a space for a little bit. Um, and then we, re, we kind of retreated back into the home and, uh, cause that's where we started. We started in the home, uh, doing core group meetings and prayer, prayer, you know, prayer evenings and things like that. And then finally we started kind of meeting weekly, uh, in a space. It just didn't feel like us. It was just official, um, the rows, the, you know, it it looked like what you would expect, you know, for a church gathering, but it just felt so artificial and empty and void. And um, and so we just we decided to come back to the home and just like let's just search the scriptures, let's just kind of dig in and and ask the Lord what He's calling us into. And we went on a journey of kind of redefining what church life is and what it looks like. We started in that passage in Acts two. We spent multiple weeks just looking at Acts two forty two to forty seven, and we just really dissected it. Really looked at it as as being kind of a an idealized model of what the church would look like, and we began to expand upon that and look at the other New Testament letters. And yeah. What does it look like for us to be as called called up followers of Christ? Yeah, let's go back just a moment. You talked about you did you did the the typical thing that you do. You begin to gather people into a, a location, mm-hmm. and you said that that felt artificial. What mm-hmm. do you mean? You know, it um, it it what's interesting is when you get people together face to face, and then all of a sudden you you take that away because again we were meeting in the home at first, and then we're getting to know each other. You're sitting in a circle in a room. You're face to face. You're closer. You're intimate. You're praying together. Then suddenly you get them in a room. It's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to start doing services. We're going to start doing church. You know what I mean? We're going to, we're going to go do what we're supposed to do. Right. And everybody gets there and suddenly you realize there's something off about this. Mm -hmm. Um, We're now facing the foot. We're now all in rows. We're facing forward. We're listening to pastor Matt. There's somebody who's leads a song and it's just, it just felt empty. It just felt like there, it just felt devoid of presence of the spirit. It felt like it was losing authenticity. Um, and it just felt like, wow, I, you, even at some point it's like, why would I, why would I come to this, this new thing, this new startup when there are a dozen churches in my community that are already doing this at a much higher capacity and level? Um, there had to be something else that was drawing us closer together and growing us together as a family and as a community. And um, it wasn't going to be found in producing this, this other, this is what we typically do. So we knew that we needed to retool. We needed, we needed something different. Um, and it wasn't difference. It was just the sake of realizing this just feels empty. This, this, is, this is not satisfying us. We actually were closer together when we started in the home, and mm. now that's been lost. Mm. So we wanted to regain what we had lost. So we went back to the house. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What a what a transition. I mean, that breaks everything that 
uh, church planters uh, have learned, right? Uh, <laughs> it's the church planters' greatest fear because they tell you once you go back, once you once you go backwards like that. There's a key word in church planting is keyword organizational growth. It's called momentum. Mm. And when you lose, they, they claim it's a momentum killer, right? Like you go backwards like that and you've killed momentum. And, mm. and actually I would say, um, yeah, for, for a moment, we felt like we lost momentum um, because, but the momentum that we thought we were gaining was artificial and it was already going away. Okay. So when we went back to the house, we were actually gaining new momentum. So there was actually momentum being built again back in the house, um, but it just was coming in a different format. Yeah, neat. Yeah, that's cool. Now, you, you, when you did this, when you made this transition back, uh, yeah. you lost momentum, then you were regaining momentum. You did something rather unique. Um, it, talk about that. It, you, you took the sermon and you shifted it to be something different. Yeah. Let me just speak one thing to the momentum piece too. Yeah. And because when we talk about momentum, we tend to think about momentum as in personal growth we, uh, in terms of like number of people, attendance, energy in the room, um, you know, finances, uh, excitement, you know what I mean? We kind of talk about it in those kind of terms. Uh, the momentum that I'm speaking of that we were gaining was actually a spiritual momentum. Mm. It was a discipleship momentum. It was a personal growth momentum. Uh, I can't say that we looked at our church and said, wow, so then we went back home and suddenly like 30 new people showed up the next week. Like that was not, that wasn't happening either way. <laughs> like it wasn't happening when we were meeting at a location and it wasn't going to definitely happen in the home. Right. But the momentum we began to gain was actually one of of, of a spirit led momentum. It was actually a personal growth momentum. It was actually, we're learning how to be disciples of Jesus and mm. to be followers of his ways. So with that, yes, we ended up changing, uh, and, and offloading. Cause what we started doing is we started interacting with these ideas of church growth movements. I started looking at, you know, um, we're not church growth movements. I'm sorry. Um, church planting movements, CPMs. And we started beginning to look at, um, like learning from some of those authors and some of those writers, we were looking at what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus. That was something that was uh, very ill-defined for me. And I began to d rediscover um, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. Um, some of the writings from Bill Hall, uh, it, it have actually been very influential for me. Uh, so that was kind of something that was really grabbing my attention. You and I were also beginning our conversations around this time as well too. So uh, I think as you and I were talking and processing these things out and looking at Ephesians, that was also influencing me very much. And so we began to look at what does discipleship look like? And I realized, man, how we grow as disciples, and how we learn um, is is something about we don't learn passively how to you know, if we're just filling the head uh, we're missing the heart we're missing the hands and so I'm um, also as one who teaches in higher academia and so one who teaches as an adjunct uh, professor um, I was also learning different teaching methodologies and one of the different teaching teaching methodologies is what they call flipping the classroom. And, um, and so basically what has been going on in higher education for a number of years is they create active learning environments. And these active learning environments are basically ones where the assignment is given in advance, a lecture, maybe even a video lecture is given in advance, or a podcast to listen to, a book to read, a chapter to read. And then what they do is the students are going to be kind of filled with the head knowledge outside of class. They then return to class, and then it's, that information then is practically applied and processed out together. And so whether through group activity, uh, in-classroom discussion, something that you do hands-on, whatever that might look like, we do this together. And and the instructor now, rather than becoming the lecturer and the all important knowledge, knowledge head information, I'm, I'm the all wise one who knows all information. And my job is simply to disseminate it to you in a lecture format. I now become a facilitator. Mm -hmm. I become a facilitator of ideas. I become a facilitator of experience. I become a facilitator of one's faith and one's souls as I relate to it, it is specifically even in the church context. And so that was the main shift that we made is like, I'm not going to move from a uh, proclaimer teacher. Um, I'm going to move from lecturer expert, to, uh, expert, exactly, which um, I don't claim to be uh, anyway, to now facilitator. Mm -hmm. And so the way to do that is people still are wired in, we found people are still very much wired to receive, um, 
sermons and teachings. And so what I did is I started podcasting them. I started just doing them in advance. I do them right here and record them. And then uh, we would send them out in advance. And then people were beginning to listen to those during the week. And then they were engaged with that material. And then we would come together. And then I became a facilitator. Yeah. Now you've recently made a shift and, um, and it sounds like you're excited about that shift, uh, but let me, let me just go back a moment and say, yeah. that I, I thought that was one of the brilliant things that you all did. Um, but still it, it set you up to continue on being the talking head, so to speak, the, the expert, the person with the content, the knowledge that you yeah. have to disseminate to other people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, I think um, the, the value that we were seeing in this was by doing this. And, and I don't think the idea is totally dead, uh, but we are, and I'll talk about that in a moment about the shift that we've now made just recently um, to kind of move away from that. But I would suggest that it was actually incredibly beneficial for us. Mm. Um, when we really want to say that we believe in this priesthood of all believers, we must believe that the Holy Spirit is indwelt amongst all believers. And that all believers, as we look at Ephesians 4.11, uh, are gifted with some sort of apostolic, um, prophetic, evangelistic, um, shepherding, teaching gift that they are meant to be shared with the body for the edification of the whole body. And so when you only have the one person who's either a, like a shepherd teacher giving all the information and nobody else has anywhere else to take their gifts, then the whole body is being stunted and grown uh, from, from growth. And so we hear that again, reiterated when our conversation with Alan Hirsch a couple of weeks ago, but this is something we've been convicted on. Like I was like, I was convinced like this is a problem. And so um, we wanted to kind of begin to, to build that facilitation uh, model with others. And so that was incredibly helpful. We were seeing people's discipleship was growing dramatically. People mm. were, 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 I think, engaging the word in different ways. They were learning things that they wouldn't learn before. People were being able to speak up and share things that even I wasn't sharing. People were able to correct me in the room and go, hey, Matt, you, 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 I think you got this part wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know what? I think you're right. I think I did. You know, um, proven once again, I'm not the expert. but. Um, you know, but I think that that was, it was valuable for the entire body and the whole community to come in, to come at this and go, this is, this is how our faith has worked out together. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, you're right. It was still setting me up as still being the expert. It was still setting me up as I'm the primary teacher, the primary expert. Uh, I'm the one with the, the video equipment. I'm the one with the time and the energy to do the, to do all this work. And my concern comes out of, um, I know that there's more for us as the church. I know that there's also uh, a, a reality that I can't always give this time. It's a reliance upon me. And it's also not re fully replicatable. Like not every mm -hmm. person, not every church, not every, if, if there are going to be more churches like this that want to do something like this, not every pastor, teacher, leader of a church is going to be able to do this. And so I wanted something to go, I want everyone in this room to feel like that one day they can walk out and they can go lead their own church and not feel like they have to have a seminary degree to do that. Um, and as long as I kept teaching and as long as I keep being the primary leader, then that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point. I mean, the, what we're seeing in church planting movements around the world, of course, is this uh, ease of reproducing so that it, it happens quickly and ongoing. Um, but at the same time, there is th that danger of, of uh, straying, if you will, from a uh, correct teaching. Talk about that. Yeah. And this is a conversation you and I have had a few times too. And I know we keep coming back to, and I know I have this with a lot of other people and I go, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. I think there's still a place for the seminary. Mm -hmm. I think that the seminary still serves an important role in the church, um, in training people on how to read the scriptures, know the, know the, um, the ancient languages, um, how to interpret, learn some, you know, um, and, and I think that that's helpful and because it, we need those people to teach other people to do that as well. And those people who have the ability and the time and the resources to go and further their education, to be a blessing to the church, I think is a blessing to the church. I think that is, that is helpful. Um, but so I, I think that that's a, that there's still a place for that and we still need those people. Um, and yet, you know, I, one of the things that I think we've been learning as we do this podcast is we always talk about doing theology and community. Yeah, exactly. And, and I've learned that there's a, there is a great, there's something special about that that I think kind of rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Maybe I don't, you know, but I, I realize that I understand the fears behind that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. But yet we've also see like, how often do we have a senior unchecked leader 
that um, we, we claim, you know, has th their character is marred or whatever the case may be. But we have these unchecked leaders who start teaching heresy. Mm. I, you know, I, I think that when you're in a humble community, you realize that you don't, your income isn't like, have to be supported by the people who are in the room. They're not there just to listen to you. And yet they're there to grow together in community. And God has, has equipped you to be a leader in this church in the context with everyone else in the room. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and working with, within all of us. That then even the this, this, this senior leader then has a lot to learn from those in the room. And that requires a great humility. That requires a great um, a courage to be able to admit to that. And to step back off of that platform and to give other people the platform. And um, even if the platform is merely purely, you know, a, a hypothetical one in a living room, um, I think that there's something really to that. And when we learn that we learn that there are other theological ideas that we can be begin growing together in and we can learn from one another and uh, hold each other accountable to even our historic creeds. Yeah, that's great. And I think so key in uh, uh, this whole process of reproducibility, um, doing theology and community is critical um, to that. Tell us, Matt, now you've made a shift uh, away from being the talking head. Um, <laughs> how does that impact or does it impact uh, what you guys are doing at Restoration? Um, so we're only a few weeks into this, but, um, what I've done is I've, I've backed off of the, the, the pre-video content. Uh, we've done this before actually. So it's not like this is brand new to us, but we are going through a book of the Bible right now. We decided we're studying the book of John and, uh, we're taking it just, you know, piece by piece. And, uh, the way we've been operating actually for a long time now, and I think we've actually been working up to this. So this is really just kind of the next phase. Uh, what we started doing back in the fall was even though I was still producing all the content ahead of time. Uh, we were rotating homes. So we began to rotate mm -hmm. homes across about four or five different homes in four or five different communities um, in, our, in our area. And whenever we were at somebody's home, that person who was hosting was also the one who was facilitating the conversation. Yeah, great. So my role became kind of a backseat role. Like my job was done by the time I hit Sunday. My job was to show up, to be there with my family, and to be a supportive role for everyone else there in the room. Um, and so... Uh, that we were already kind of moving into this, into this kind of role and in, into this kind of, you know, methodology, if you will. So the content was already produced. Now the people who were leading were just simply facilitating the conversation. Um, and I think that's been working out really well. And so now we kind of hit this month or the last, uh, really the beginning of this year. And we decided that um, I'm going to back off of that um, and off of the pre, the pre, predetermined content. We're just going to be going through the passage. Everyone knows what the passage is. And now those leaders are now encouraged just to continue to lead and facilitate conversation. Uh, it requires a little bit more on the, on people ahead of time, just to continue to study uh, the passages on their own, to read them. But we're already in that habit already. They were already listening to a sermon. They're mm. already looking at the passages mm. themselves. Now it's just kind of becoming a little bit more self-feeding. Um, there might be a little bit more teaching that takes place on Sunday mornings now. Um, that might've been, but there's really no sermons that are giving, uh, given necessarily. It uh, doesn't mean that we're out on sermons. It just means that that's just not the context and the the meat of the day. The meat of the right. day, you look at this is we're emphasized and focused on the word of God. And we- As a community. Out, as a community yeah. together. And we're growing together. We have discussions together. Uh, we're, we're looking at the text. We're applying the text. And we're praying over, uh, you know, just in concert with the Holy Spirit and asking him to reveal himself to us. Mm, that's neat. Well, tell us- uh, what does it look like? A typical gathering, you guys come together on Sundays. What are you hoping to accomplish there? So, so everybody before they show up, have to, uh, an email goes out in the middle of the week. They know what passage we're going to be studying. They have to study the passage during the week. They're expected to read it. They're expected to meditate on it. They're expected to take some notes and just process a few things out. Usually a question or two is given to them to think through so that they have something prepared on Sunday morning to come ready to talk about uh, regarding the passage and that they've allowed the Holy Spirit to already speak to them regarding as to what they're reading about and interacting with God and his word. So now you've got somebody who's already done some homework ahead of time, um, and now they come together on Sunday. Sunday mornings are, you know, we start at 10 o'clock and we go till a, a noon. We're at like a two-hour gathering. Um, you know, there's coffee, there's some treats, there's this conversation that takes place uh, for the good 15 or 20 minutes as we're all gathering, getting, uh, just catching up on each other's weeks. 
we then gather together for some formal time. Um, and we get together in a living room, uh, chairs, couches, and, um, we've got, you know, a couple people who, who play instruments. So every once in a while, th- those people will bring some prepared music, um, to sing. Sometimes we don't have that. Sometimes like last week, we just kind of, we got, we got onto YouTube or Spotify and played a couple of our favorite worship songs, uh, to attach to a Bluetooth speaker. And we just meditate over that, you know, and hear that music and that, um, and, and just allow, you know, that worship just to kind of uh, guide our hearts and our minds, uh, in, uh, towards Jesus. And so, and then we usually spend some time in prayer, just praying for each other's needs, just praying for our community, praying for, uh, just what, you know, what's going on in our lives that day or in this week. And so, uh, this worship and prayer, it's just free flowing. Uh, it's not super rigid. It's just, it is what it is. Um, and we just, uh, invite ourselves and invite the Holy spirit, um, into our lives and into just to kind of move through the morning. Yeah. Great. Now you, you, you all observe <clears throat> communion. Yeah. So after, after our kind of our worship and prayer time, we then go into the discussion time over the word. And that's usually a good, like 45 minute discussion, um, of, of time that we are interacting together. Uh, and then we close every one of our gathering with communion. So we look at Acts 2.42 when it says the breaking of bread. Um, you know, we know that those were probably more like love feasts and meals. Um, uh, I'd love for us to get to that place where we're doing that on a regular basis. We haven't yet built that into our culture. But for now, we are practicing uh, just the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, if you will. And, uh, just, and we're just at the table every week, centering our hearts and our minds together on Jesus Christ. And actually... Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. If I could say this, that has been an incredibly healing moment for a lot of time Mm. and a lot Mm. of moments Mm. because doing theology and community can be contentious. Would you agree with that? Oh, Michael? absolutely. Absolutely. So, so when we do theology and community, it can be very contentious and you can have different, you, you got people, I, I'm telling you, like we've got the spectrum in the, in the room. Okay. The spectrum <laughs> is in the room on, on, in, within Christian thought and thinking. And, um, sometimes depending upon what we're talking about that morning, it can become very contentious. Mm-hmm. And every time we end together and we say, listen, even though this is, this may have been an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of us. There on the table right now before us represented is Christ's body broken and his blood shed for us. Wow. And we unify ourselves and declare our allegiance to that man, to Jesus Christ. And we leave our ways behind and we choose to follow his ways. Mm. And wherever we walk out of here together today, however we decided to believe on some of these secondary issues of theology, we together are going to walk and commit our, our lives to the ways of Jesus. Can we yeah. agree upon that? And I'll tell you, those have been some very healing moments uh, uh-huh. for us um, and has been ma- a lot of growth for us. And I'll tell you, as a pastor and as a senior leader and as one who has been programmed and taught to talk, to, to, to communicate and communicate articulately, you know, like I'm, my, my former degree is in, in, in television production. I, you know, we've joked about my Emmy awards. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, it, it's as like, I, as I say, your Grammy awards. Yeah. Grammys. No, I'm not a singer. So <laughs> <laughs> nobody's ever going to award me a Grammy. That's for sure. Um, so, but you know, for like, but like, you know, you know, I know how to communicate, know how to sell an idea, know how to, how, how to, how to cast vision. And there's nothing more frightening than for the visionary to stand in a room and all of a sudden the room goes sideways and the room divides into two different spectrums and says, I'm over here and I'm over here, right? Mm-hmm. And it's far easier to build a church around yourself and around your ideas and around what you think the word of God says and to communicate that clearly and articulately and not provide an avenue for people to be able to talk to you or, to, or to, for them to interact with each other on these ideas. Um, and it's far easier just to control the message. It's yeah. far easier to control the message and the method. And when you do that, we stunt the spirit's growth and, the, wow. and stunt the spirit's work in the church. And I'm convinced that that's a major issue in our churches today. And what it does, it requires us to step out into the discomfort and it requires us to get the diversity of thoughts and opinions in the room and for us to look at each other in the face and maybe even disagree but then we come together and we center ourselves at the true head of the church. And his name is Jesus Christ. And yes. we say, this is who we obey to. This is who we're going to bow to today. And this is who we're going to believe. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That really is. Wow. That is, and, and powerful. Wow. I love that, Matt. Yeah. It, praise it, the it, Lord that Jesus unites us. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he's not concerned about our theological yeah. differences. He's concerned about our hearts being yeah. fully devoted to him. 
you know, and I would say that that's, that's hard. Mm. hard for us. I think it's hard for us as Westerners. I think it's hard for us as, as pastors, as those who grow up in a theological school who say, you know, Hey, this is the doctrine I learned. I'm a, I'm a neo-Calvinist and this is what, who I am. And, and this is, uh, you know, I'm all five points and this is what, this is what's going to be. And, and I'm convinced on this and I want everybody else to believe it too. Um, <clears throat> I, I get that. Like, I totally get that. I went to a neo-Calvinist, you know, seminary and then even coming out, out of that, I'm just like, you know, scratching my head on a few things, but I go, you know, I just, like I, I get it, and it's there's safety in that. There's comfort in that for for us and for others. But we realize that the world is actually far more complicated. It's far more nuanced than that, and we realize that the scripture is also far more nuanced than that as well. Mm-hmm. And we have to get down to those basic essentials and learn to work with each other. And I think the world is actually passing us up on this. And I think this is why people are out on church and mm-hmm. out on Christianity is because we've kind of tried to force feed narrow minded. Uh, theology, and I'm not trying to go liberal on us. I'm just tr- simply just trying to say we get into our narrow lanes and say this is the way it is. If you don't like it, go find somebody else. Um, and I and I'm saying, actually, I think w- when we see clearly the scripture is when we see in Ephesians uh, one when when uh, when Paul says that Christ has come to unite all things together under uh, you know when all things are going to be united together under Christ. He wants to unite all things, everything. Everything's yeah, going to come together yeah. under Christ. And it includes a diversity of thought, includes diversity of cultures, includes a diversity of languages and peoples and, 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 and ideologies. And, and we got to figure that out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we got to figure that out. And if we want to see that beautiful day of revelation when all, pe- when, when all tears are gone, all pain and suffering is gone, and there's the diversity, in the, uh, the, the diversity of all peoples that has ever been created in this world that come together under one headship of Jesus Christ uh, in the new heavens and the new earth, then we got to learn how to bring about his kingdom now together on the earth. And I think that this is the undoing of that. And I think that we're trying to relearn how to do that. Yeah. Well, in our small, little, tiny living room corner of Lake Zurich, Illinois. <laughs> Well, that's a beautiful picture. It really is. And one of the beauties too that I'm seeing at Restoration is that it just doesn't stop there. I mean, you you have your times of prayer and worship of fellowship. You're, you're, you're discussing, there's discipleship that's taking place there. People are growing. The Holy Spirit is moving in the lives of people. You're celebrating uh, the unity that you find in at recognizing Jesus as the only head of the church, mm-hmm. but there's service that happens, right? I mean, it, it just doesn't stop at the, at that house. Yeah, you guys are going out the door after that. Talk about what you guys have done in terms of uh, engaging your community. So uh, I wish I wish I could say that we have been excelling here, um, but I can't. Um, but I we are growing in this, um, and I know this is a, this is an area that we need to continue to be pushing ourselves towards more. Um, you know, we, we're always talking about, we're sent on mission. How are we impacting our world? How are we impacting our communities? How are we going back into the workplaces? How are we going back to our homes and our families and, and sharing this life and, and loving others as we love ourselves? And so, uh, there is, that is happening. Uh, we've got a gentleman in our community, in, in our church who went back into his neighborhood back in the fall. And, uh, you know, I had given everybody an assignment actually at one point to, to do something like to ask a, a bit of a contentious question to some neighbors or something like go find one person in the community. Well, he went to everybody in his, in his neighborhood and started talking to everybody about asking these questions uh-huh. and some unique, uh, just some cool conversations were taking place in that and some new opportunities for faith, faith sharing came out of, uh, because of that. And so mm-hmm. I'm just grateful for Scott's boldness for when he did that in his community, because all of a sudden it created some new avenues for him to kind of begin to have these conversations and make himself known, but also not being, um, you know, overly bold and uh, wasn't able to, he, you know, he, he didn't turn anybody off. That was what was so great about it is he was asking a, a question out from humility and out of that humility was coming more dialogue and more conversations and some bridges were beginning to be built there. So, um, again, like we don't have this amazing story to say, yeah, the whole neighborhood became, you know, <laughs> followers of Christ. But, um, you know, I, I just think that, that those are some of the, the bridges that we're, we're learning to build. And some of the places that we used to close ourselves off to as Christians are now being reopened again for us. And we're trying to learn how do we step into those places and mm-hmm. how do we live as missionaries in our own neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that it's happening. People are, are engaging. They're not just leaving their faith in uh, that in your community, but they're taking it out in, into their worlds. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you're going out into the community. You're, you're, you're uh, looking for these opportunities. Um, but, but there's more to it too, right? Um, 
after your gathering and as the people, as your folks go out during the week, what are they doing? What are some of the post gathering uh, results that you're seeing? Yeah. So, you know, things that we're constantly encouraging ourselves to do. Um, I don't know how always how effective we were at it, but something we're always constantly encouraging to do is, is we prayerfully consider what has been talked about on Sundays, what we've, what we've been processing through, how the Holy Spirit's been moving us and changing us. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of like, we're, we're up here in the head a lot. Um, and then we're, the heart is being shaped right? So it's that head, heart, hands. And so we are really, really thinking through the head again and really processing through, like, okay, what are we learning about? And how is this rethinking about some of the things that I've been told or I've been, I've been taught in the past? And, and then on the, how is this really reforming my heart? How am I really thinking about my neighbors? You know, we're starting to have conversations of like, man, how, and I used to think as a Christian, as a conservative Christian, that the LGBTQ agenda is probably the most heinous thing I could ever possibly think of. And I should object to that at every level, right? Mm -hmm. We're now starting to see our conversations around that change. We're starting to see ourselves go, these are people to be loved. They are mm -hmm. made in the image of God. And they are people who need to know who Jesus is, just like any one of us. And so those are conversations that are starting to change. Um, you know, uh, and, and so I, I think it's exciting to see um, how how people are reengaging that conversation and are thinking differently about it than they used to and are even acting upon it. I don't know how much of this I can share uh, publicly, but we have a woman in our church who works uh, as a as a counselor uh, at a local high school. She was tasked actually with from the administration to create a safe space for the LGBTQ students in her school mm. uh, to communicate. They didn't have a club. They didn't have something for them to engage with. And so uh, she was tasked with that. And it was really great to have a conversation with her, to hear how she embraced that actually opportunity, seeing them as children that God desperately wants to know. And that seeing that these were, that these are, that these are students that are kind of cast um, to the side and yet didn't have a space of their own to freely have conversations with trusted counselors or trusted people. They're going to help them just kind of have a safe space to talk to. Yeah. And um, that didn't exist in their public school. And so she had an opportunity to be a part of that process. There's no explicit, you know, because of her role, there's no explicit, um, you know, sharing of, of, of her faith. There's no explicit sharing of the gospel because of where she's at at this moment. Um, but she knows the reason why she's doing it behind the scenes is because she, because she sees and she's reading the scriptures. We're, we're having these conversations of what does it mean for us to love God and love our neighbors we love ourselves yeah. and realizing like, this is part of my role of what it means to unite all things together in Jesus Christ. Mm. And this is part of, I don't know what influence this is going to have long-term, but I know that I can be that if I want to establish myself as somebody who's safe to talk to then I need to establish myself as somebody who's safe to talk to in these in these scenarios. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily mean that she agrees with the actions. <clears throat> right. And so I think that that's the tension that we as Christians have is like how do we how do we love um even if we're not um necessarily embracing of the ideas, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do we walk away even within Christianity? How do we walk away with two different ideas on 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 end times? One could be premillennial, the other one could be an amillennial. And how do you walk away going, hey man, I totally disagree with you on how you see the end times occurring, right? And this is this to us is like something that only Christians argue about, right? Um, and it sounds like completely ridiculous, but for some people, it becomes a contentious issue of, you know, are you do you believe in inerrancy or not? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I would argue to say, yes, both do. But th there's an there's an issue there by saying, are we going to draw our lines here? Or are we going to learn to love each other as we love as we love our neighbor and realize that it's okay that we're going to have some different opinions on this, um, and and move forward together, waiting and listening to the Holy Spirit and how do we love each other? Um, and so I think that there's just been some kind of cool moments like that where we've really been wanting to how do we really learn to reengage our communities and how do we engage the world um, as those who are followers of Christ and do that in a in a way that's respectful mm. and in a way that is also Holy Spirit led and powerful. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that reminds me of Acts 19.37 with Aristarchus and Gaius. And we've talked about this before, that here they are, these two Christians uh, about to get uh, uh, flogged almost, it's, it feels like, in the middle of a riot in Ephesus. 
and the town clerk rises up and says, you know, these men are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. And what a testimony that speaks of those two Christians who weren't out beating people over the head with their Bibles about what it is <laughs> they believe, but they were bringing Christ. And, uh, and he is the only stumbling block to a relationship with God, not our, not our, uh, not what we think uh, people need to do or who they need to be, but Jesus and Jesus alone is that stumbling block. Right, right. Doesn't mean that we agree, but we can still be respectful. Um, yeah, and, and is there not room for that? I mean, you know, we always look at, you know, Paul and Peter, they were divisive on on multiple issues, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the New Testament, um, Paul opposing Peter to his face, even, and, uh, you know, he writes uh, half the book of Galatians, just recounting that, you know, what occurred at the, uh, the Council of Jerusalem in Acts, um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, it's, it, and we look at both Paul, and we look at both Peter, and we say, they were both right. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They were both inspired by the Spirit. They both were working in, in some different contexts, and they were both looking at the same scriptures together. And we go, like, listen, there's something to be learned here from that. And I think that we, too, um, also are going to have some of those diversive opinions. And, um, and again, it, it, it's not a case for one or the other. It's just that how do we learn to go together? Because we have one mission and one mission in mind, and that is uniting all things together in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's the mission that we're part of. And so, um, and like you said, is Christ the only stumbling block? Yeah, good. Good, Matt. Well, that's, that's got to be a topic for another podcast. I mean, there are, you know, these theological controversies that uh, have divided uh, Christendom over the centuries, but there are social uh, issues as well that uh, divide us, and, and maybe we can pick that up on another podcast. Um, because we, we're, what we're not saying is that we want to acquiesce to every social issue and say, you know, we want to speak favorably at, about these things. But at the same time, we want to be able to be in a position to properly engage uh, in these social issues because yeah. Jesus clearly car- calls us to uh, care for the marginalized. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and actually I would even say too, like, um, you know, I, I'm kind of going back to what Jeff Christofferson said uh, in our interview with him. And that was, uh, you know, we're operating, the church is operating with like a, you know, what, what do you say? Like it was, you know, we're operating in like a 19th century model with a 16th century operating system you know, but in a, in the 21st century, it looks more like the first century, yeah, right? right? You know, it's just got this like, whoa, okay, like, you know, you're trying to think through like, okay, the different formulas that we've kind of pieced together a little bit and just Reformation, Reformation era, you know, theology that we just continue to propagate today. And again, I, I like, I'm not hating on Luther. I'm not hating on Calvin. It's just, th- these are the theologians that we have inherited and, and they've given us much to think about um, when it comes to interacting with scripture and culture. And yet, we're in a day and age in which uh, I, I think that we are seeing that this this need to return to almost the simplicity of of the, of the scriptures, the simplicity of what it looks like to be Christ followers and that early church. And so, for us as Restoration Church, we're trying not to get ourselves caught up in a lot of those controversies, but rather just keep ourselves um, the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. Right. Good. And that is. We want to we want to be Holy Spirit led people, and we want to follow the ways of Jesus, yeah. and and we want to see those with just clear eyes. We want to take away a lot of the other baggage and the other kind of things that we've constructed that hinder that. And and we all know that we all deal with the bias of of modern day bias, and and um, reader bias. When we read back into Scripture, we read the word church in Scripture we have one or two images that come to mind. There's mm-hmm. a pastor and there's a building with pews. I mean, like that's what comes to mind every time we read that church. You know, when we read the word church in the, in the, in the New Testament, we think, you know, Middle Ages church. We think, you know, early basilicas because those are the pictures that we've been given. But those things came hundreds of years later. Yeah. Um, and so like, like we're, we're thinking, we have to just kind of, we got to move beyond that a little bit and we have to kind of take the, some of those things out. So we've just kind of, at Restoration Church, we've just really simplified and just said, here are our core values. These are the things that we're just going to live and die by. 
we're going to live and die by the scriptures. Like that's the hill we're going to die on. We're going to read it. We're going to read the scriptures. We're going to believe in them. We're going to believe in the gospel and the gospel message of Jesus. We're going to, um, we're going to believe in community. Community is, is core to us. Like we are doing community. We're living in community. We're being the community of followers of Christ together. Mm. Um, worship. We, we, we believe in the worship of God and him alone. Uh, number five is prayer. Uh, we want to be prayerful people and spirit filled people. And six is mission. We live on mission for, for the Lord mm-hmm. and, um, and in Christ. And so that's, those are like the six values that we're just like, this is what we're about. And this is what we're talking about all the time is how do we do these things and how do we main, remain, remain faithful to them? Wow. That's great. Beautiful picture. Beautiful. I love what you guys are doing, Matt. Very encouraged with Restoration Church and the path that God has you on. I know you haven't arrived there yet. And uh, is there a rival? Is there, there's not going to be an arrival. Yeah, that's what I was afraid you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, there's a journey. It's a journey, and uh, fun, fun for me to be on this with you. I'm looking forward to being with you guys too. In a, in what two months or something? Yeah, um, yeah. And we're excited to to have you join us and and be with us too. And um, it'll be good to have you in person again and and uh, kind of hang out with our crew. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, this is a good place to wrap up our podcast uh, for this time. And so, Matt, why don't you take us home? <laughs> why don't you take us home? You <laughs> I don't give remember it, how to do you it. Give it a whirl. I know. I've, uh, <laughs> we've heard this uh, so many times. I should no, have just have it memorized. Well, this has been good. And thanks, thanks, Michael. Thanks for letting, letting me uh, share our story. And uh, it's admittedly a bit vulnerable too to to share. So um, I just thank you for that, and and um, and thank you for your ongoing encouragement and coaching for us as well too. Uh, behind the scenes, most of our church may not always know so much about the influence that you have uh, on us as well, but just grateful for you and just as we continue to process these things together. So um, yeah, so thanks for that. And thanks for the opportunity to share too. So mm-hmm. pleasure. Well, and for that and for our listeners, thanks for joining us on this edition of the Ephesiology Podcast. Uh, don't forget the book, uh, the Ephesiology book, book. is available uh, now. Uh, I think this it's comes pre-ordered. out. Pre-ordered. Yeah. Pre-ordered. It's available on pre-order. It comes yeah. out at the end of the month on it's Leap 11 Days. 11 days from now. That's amazing. So uh, be sure to, uh, if you haven't pre-ordered it yet, head on over to physiology.com. You can pre-order the copy of the book there and you can get um, learn more about just getting this theocentric uh, idea of a, mi- a missional church and, and being the church together um, and just kind of all these ideas that we keep processing through. Uh, I can't encourage you enough uh, to be reading this because I think it's going to be a real game changer for the future of the church, especially in the West. Uh, so head on over to physiology.com. And of course, as you, as a, as, as a listener and doing theology together and community with us, uh, you can find us on Facebook as well uh, by searching for uh, the Physiology Facebook page. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and uh, always just being, uh, send us your questions, comments. Uh, we love hearing from you um, and uh, engaging with you on all these ideas. So for Michael, myself, and Andrew, who is not present with us today, we miss him, but uh, we'll be back again next week with another edition of the Physiology Podcast. All right, that was a good one.